The trophic hormone, that is going to be ACTH, exactly. And the androgens that are made from the adrenal cortex, remember the reticularis is going to make these adrenal androgens, that's going to be called DHEAS, okay? And remember, these adrenal androgens are not controlled by LH. Usually we think of androgens being controlled by luteinizing hormone, but these adrenal androgens are going to be controlled by ACTH. The important part is you need to know that the glomerulosa is going to be under the effect or control of angiotensin II. So let's go through normal histology. Glomerulosa, fasciculata, reticularis. Glomerulosa related to mineralocorticoids, fasciculata reticular, uh, uh, related to cortisol and glucocorticoids, and reticularis is going to be androgen related. So testosterone is made to active DHT by which enzyme? Testosterone to active DHT is going to be by 5-alpha reductase. Remember, this is in the adrenal and in the gonads. This 5-alpha reductase takes testosterone and makes it into dihydrotestosterone. There's a good pharmacology tie-in because in pharmacology, we have a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. And what's that 5-alpha reductase inhibitor? Finasteride. Finasteride blocks the finishing step in testosterone synthesis, testosterone to DHT, finasteride. Aromatase takes testosterone. Aromatase takes testosterone and makes it into estrogen. And this is not in the adrenal gland. You get this aromatase as specifically in the uh, gonads um, and the ovary in particular. Okay? So let's go through how I'm going to cover endocrinology. We're going to give you the hormone and then the pathology by ACTH. And what is going to be the derivation of ACTH? Remember, ACTH is going to be derived from POMC, and that's huge. ACTH is going to be derived from POMC. And POMC is kind of like the big loaf of bread. And the slices are going to be ACTH, MSH, and beta endorphins. And why is that important? Because in primary adrenal insufficiency, you need to note that patients are going to be hyperpigmented. So ACTH increases desmolase, and desmolase is going to catalyze the reaction to make cholesterol into pregnilolone, and that's what's going to stimulate this cortisol synthesis. So patient with recurrent infections and diabetes is found to have high cortisol levels. So how does cortisol cause you to become hyperglycemic and cause you to be immunosuppressed? Well, IL-2 production, which is the T uh, cell uh, proliferator, is going to be blocked by cortisol. And the other thing that cortisol is going to do is it's going to stimulate gluconeogenesis. So what is the mechanism of action of cortisol? Remember that steroid hormones like cortisol, steroid hormones, estrogen, aldosterone, they have intranuclear receptors that translocate to the nucleus, and that is particularly high yield for you to know in terms of steroid hormones and their receptor physiology. What is the mechanism by which cortisol increases the blood pressure? Well, cortisol increases alpha receptors, and that's why cortisol is going to be a uh, stress hormone in particular. It is going to potentiate the effect of which hormone? Cortisol makes what hormone work a little bit better? Catecholamines, in particularly epinephrine and norepinephrine. So the quintessential cortisol or cortex pathology is going to be congenital adrenal hyperplasia. An infant presents with hypotension and hyperkalemia that presents with ambiguous genitalia. So hypotension, hyperkalemia, and ambiguous genitalia. She is in profound shock and found to have low cortisol levels. That's not good, low cortisol levels. What newborn screening test may be useful in this patient? So when we're thinking about congenital adrenal hyperplasia, the most common enzyme deficiency in congenital adrenal hyperplasia is what? 21 hydroxylase deficiency. And if you have a 21 hydroxylase deficiency in your adrenal cortex, all of the precursors or the metabolites are going to shift, right? And they shift towards the androgen side, right? And when they shift to the androgen side, that's what's going to cause you to have this ambiguous genitalia. So while you're making that shift to the androgen side, the key thing in the newborn screen that we look at is 17-hydroxyprogesterone. And this 17-hydroxyprogesterone is going to be elevated in patients who have 21-beta-hydroxylase deficiency. Remember, 11-beta-hydroxylase deficiency and 17-beta-hydroxylase deficiency, this is part of the same pathway in your adrenal cortex. They're a little bit lower yield, but these deficiencies present with normal or hypertension. And the way that I like to remember it is that if it has a 1 in the first digit, it's going to have hypertension, i.e. up arrow for you. Cushing syndrome. What is the difference between Cushing's disease and Cushing syndrome? Remember that Cushing disease is due to an ACTH adenoma. Cushing's disease is going to be due to an adenoma, ACTH producing adenoma. 
The syndrome is going to be some hypercortisolism in general. If I gave you steroids and be like, here are steroids for a month, you're going to have Cushing syndrome, which is going to be due to hypercortisolism or exogenous steroid use. Okay, so that's the most common cause of um, hypercortisolism. Now, this is an important vignette for you. Watch for the patient who presents with nonspecific fatigue, hypotension, and tachycardic tachycardia who was just on steroids and then you abruptly stop them. This is a good clinical tie-in for you to know that typically if we give patients steroids for a long time, we talk about something called a steroid taper. And that is because what happens is, is that chronic steroid use is going to shut down your hypothalamic pituitary axis and when you have these chronic steroids shutting down your hypothalamic pituitary axis, if you abruptly stop them, you can go into a shock-like presentation, and this is all due to these exogenous steroids suppressing the HPA axis. So let's talk about Cushing's disease, which is related to a adenoma. What is your first screening test for Cushing's disease or hypercortisolism in general? You want to get a urine-free cortisol level, okay? So after a urine-free cortisol level, you're going to do the low-dose dexamethasone test and get ACTH levels in particular, okay? So the low-dose dexamethasone uh, test, before I introduce that, I want to let you know that dexamethasone only affects the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Dexamethasone is not going to stop any exogenous steroids. Dexamethasone only affects the hypothalamic pituitary axis, okay? So if cortisol is high after your low-dose dexamethasone test, great, you have Cushing syndrome. Now, what's the next best step? After a low-dose dexamethasone, what are you going to do, guys? High-dose dexamethasone, exactly. So high-dose dexamethasone, that is hopefully, if you have a pituitary adenoma, if you have a pituitary adenoma, high-dose dexamethasone is going to suppress ACTH, because what, what are we thinking? If, if high dose dexamethasone suppresses ACTH, we are thinking about an adenoma. Again, dexamethasone only suppresses the hypothalamic pituitary axis. So the diagnosis here is a Cushing's disease caused by an adenoma, get an MRI of the pituitary. Say you get a high dose dexamethasone test, and after the high dose dexamethasone test, your ACTH levels and cortisol levels are still elevated or unchanged. What's going to be the next best step in management if you have high dose dexamethasone and that doesn't fail to suppress any of these? Well, what you are going to think of is getting a CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And here is where you can just look at the laboratory abnormalities that the USMLA can give you, okay? So when we're thinking about ectopic ACTH secretion, ectopic ACTH secretion is going to be not suppressed by high dose dexamethasone. High dose dexamethasone only affects the HPA axis. Ectopic ACTH secretion is going to be related to high ACTH levels and high cortisol levels. And so what is going to give you high ACTH levels? What lung pathology gives you? Small exactly. Small cell lung cancer causes you to have ectopic ACTH secretion. What about an adrenal adenoma? What if the adrenal adenoma was something that just keeps pouring out cortisol, 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 cortisol? Well, that cortisol is going to feed back. You're going to have low ACTH levels and high cortisol level, and adrenal adenomas are going to cause you to have Cushing syndrome as well. Now, on the other end, that is hypercortisolism, but what about Addison's disease? Addison's disease, you can translate in your mind as primary adrenal insufficiency. A 27-year-old Caucasian female presents with weight loss and weakness. She feels dizzy and lightheaded. Physical exam reveals several areas of her skin, including her elbows and her knees, that are going to be more tan than other areas. Ah, the tanning of the skin, key buzzword. What is a proper diagnostic test for this patient? Well, in endocrinology, when something's not working, you're going to do a stimulation test. That's key principle for, for endocrinology. If something's not working, hey, try to wake it up. And so what is going to be the diagnostic test? It's going to be an ACTH stimulation test. And this is going to try to diagnose Addison's disease, which is primary adrenal insufficiency. What are your metabolic abnormalities when you have primary adrenal insufficiency? Well, your metabolic abnormalities, you're going to get hypotension, sodium being low, you can get hyperkalemia, and a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. And this is due to the fact that you have shut out the glomerulosa of your adrenal cortex because you have Addison's disease, your adrenal gland doesn't really work, your adrenal cortex doesn't work, and thus you are going to get symptoms of what? you are going to get symptoms of no aldosterone being there. 
This is the highest yield thing for Addison's disease, is this hyperpigmentation. Remember, when your, when your uh, adrenal gland is not working, you are going to need increased amounts of ACTH to say, yo, come on, adrenal gland, work, work, work. Where did you get that increased amounts of ACTH from? Remember that slide talking about POMC? POMC needs to be increased in order for you have to have the increased amounts of ACTH. As a result of increasing your POMC, you're going to have increased amounts of MSH, and that MSH is high yield for you to know that causes the uh, 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 skin tanning. Patient with a hypofunctioning pituitary adenoma is found to have decreased release of ACTH. What is the likely diagnosis? So decreased release of ACTH, that is called secondary adrenal insufficiency. Primary adrenal insufficiency occurs at the primary organ, which is the adrenal gland. Secondary, you think about the brain. You are going to get normal tension, normal NA, and normal K. And now this is like, what the hell? Before primary adrenal insufficiency, you were talking about, hey, there's no aldosterone there. But now you're talking about secondary adrenal insufficiency. Hey, my ACTH is not there. Why am I not getting any changes with aldosterone stuff? Why is my sodium normal? Why is my uh, 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 blood pressure normal? And that goes back to that key physiologic concept that the glomerulosa is under control of what? Angiotensin II. Who cares about if ACTH is not there? I know that the glomerulosa is going to be under the control of angiotensin II, and that's how you tie that normal physiology in, is that secondary adrenal insufficiency, you are not gonna have issues of salt wasting. So important concept, glomerulosa is under the control of angiotensin II. What is the morphology of the bacteria that is going to cause characteristic sac of blood adrenals on gross pathology? Watch for that patient who goes into shock because of primary adrenal insufficiency or hemorrhage, essentially, that occurs of the adrenal gland. So remember, when you're talking about Neisserial infections, you're going to use ceftriaxone. Ceftriaxone is a third generation cephalosporin that has good blood-brain barrier penetration, so you can use it for meningitis as well. Now, we talk about Addison's disease. We have to pay respects to Kahn syndrome. What is Kahn syndrome? Kahn syndrome is hyper aldosteronism, exactly. So a 27-year-old male comes in with headache, muscle weakness, and a high blood pressure. Sodium is high, and potassium is kind of low-ish. They have no edema on exam. Wow, all right? What is the likely metabolic abnormality due to your acid-base physiology? Hyperaldosteronism causes you to have metabolic alkalosis, okay? And metabolic alkalosis is going to be related to aldosterone, making you pee out hydrogen, 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 and thus you have metabolic alkalosis. Hypertension, because increased amounts of aldosterone brings in the sodium, and you get hypokalemia, because I've said this over and over again. Not only do you bring in sodium, but you pee out potassium and hydrogen ions. So what happens to this patient's ionized calcium? Remember, ionized calcium is going to be the calcium that is free, i.e. the calcium that is not bound to albumin. So when you have a patient who is going to ha be, ha be very alkalotic, okay? When you have a patient who's going to be very alkalotic, what's going to happen to their ionized calcium levels? High or low? How many people say high? How many people say low? All right. How many people just don't want to vote whatsoever? All right, so it's okay. So what happens to a patient's ionized calcium levels? Well, when you're alkalotic, you have a lot of charge on albumin because glucosis and bicarb, which is negatively charged, that's going to cause you to have increased amounts of charge on albumin. Negatives attract positive. If you have more ch negative charge on albumin, remember, you are going to have a low ionized calcium. And that's because calcium is bound to albumin with alkalosis, more negative charge on albumin, and then the calcium loads onto the albumin. And that's why your serum ionized calcium goes down in alkalosis. Why doesn't this patient have edema or hypernatremia? Look back at the vignette. Where the hell is the edema? Hey, shouldn't sodium? come um, bring water with it? And aren't they gonna be Michelin man puffy? Er, that's the wrong answer because you need to know about the sodium escape. And the sodium escape is thanks to atrial natriuretic peptide. Atrial natriuretic peptide is what is going to cause you to not be fluid overload in Kahn syndrome because it's gonna make you just pee out all of that sodium and uh, uh, in particular the water as well. So what is the aldosterone to renin ratio going to be in this patient? The patient who has Kahn syndrome, because it is going to be increased amounts of aldosterone, aldosterone, the numerator is gonna go up, the denominator as a feedback is going to go down, and your aldosterone to renin ratio is going to be elevated. 
High plasma renin is not going to indicate Kahn syndrome, but remember, high plasma renin, that's due to something like secondary hyperaldosteronism. Watch for your patient who has renal artery stenosis. They're going to have high renin concentrations and thus high amounts of aldosterone. So hypertension, hypokalemia, we went through some of these, so I'm going to uh, spare you the exact details, but make sure you know that the aldosterone escape is where ANP kicks in, and ANP is going to cause you to have diuresis of that extra amounts of fluid that you're bringing in, and thus you're not going to have too much edema when you have hyperaldosteronism. Talked about the adrenal cortex, let's talk about a little bit deeper in the adrenal gland, which is the adrenal medulla. Adrenal medulla, it's all about catecholamines. What are the cells that secrete um, uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine? Those are going to be chromaffin-like cells. Chromaffin-like cells, that's different than what we talked about in GI physiology. What are enterochromaffin-like cells? They are going to release what, everybody? Histamine. Oh my gosh, everybody's awake. I love it. Remember chromaffin-like cells? They're going to be small blue cells that are going to be derived from neural crest. That's a good way for you. Anytime you see neural crest derivatives, you need to integrate what are the other neural crest derivatives in the body. So what is primarily uh, secreted from the adrenal medulla? Remember, majority is going to be epinephrine. Epinephrine has more beta agonism to, uh, greater than alpha agonism compared to norepinephrine that has more alpha agonism relative to beta agonism. And that's a good uh, adrenergic pharmacology tie-in. So what is the metabolic byproducts made by norepinephrine and epinephrine? That's going to be VMA and HVA. These are going to be the metabolic byproducts of these catecholamines. And that's going to be really important on your USMLE for those patients with pheochromocytoma that have increased amounts of catecholamines and in their PP and in their serum, you're going to have VMA and HVA going to be elevated. So wow, did I get ahead of myself? Let's talk about pheochromocytoma. Watch for the presentation of a 30-year-old female who presents with intermittent headache and palpitations. She is sweating profusely on exam. She says that this is not the first time she's feeling this. Intermittent bouts of this prosympathetic drive. What is the next best step? Well, you want to get urine metanephrines and probably a drug screen because pheochromocytoma is one of those things we learn in medical school a lot, but we rarely see them in clinical practice. One amino acids are going to be your precursors to the catecholamines. The amino acid is going to be phenylalanine and tyrosine, and that's very high yield for you to know. Anytime they ask for you to note what is the biochemical amino acid, that is a precursor to this hormone, that is how they tie in endocrine and biochemistry. That's how they integrate all of this stuff. So pheochromocytoma related to the rule of 10, 10% are bilateral, 10% are going to be extra adrenal, and 10% can be malignant. Pheochromocytoma is associated with what MEN? MEN is multiple endocrine neoplasia. That is going to be associated with MEN2A and 2B, and remember of the RET oncogene um, uh, mutation. The treatment for your pheochromocytoma goes into your adrenergic pharmacology where we talk about giving phenoxybenzamine and phenoxybenzamine is going to be a non-specific um, blocker of the alpha receptors and you give that non-specific alpha receptor blockade before you give the beta blocker. If you gave the beta blocker first, you get unopposed uh, alpha uh, agonism and that unopposed alpha agonism can cause you to have increased amounts of hypertension. So let's go through the biochemical pathway with phenylalanine eventually becoming catecholamines. Phenylalanine becomes tyrosine and tyrosine becomes dopa via tyrosine hydroxylase. Dopa then becomes dopamine because of dopa decarboxylase and dopamine becomes norepinephrine, hydroxylase, hydroxylase, decarboxylase, hydroxylase, hydroxylase, decarboxylase. And norepinephrine then gets methylated and becomes epinephrine. 